talk. So uh, I'll present uh, the work that's been going on in Orsay, uh, mostly the um, uh, PhD uh, work of Anil Murani, uh, but also that of uh, Xuan Li and, and Bastien Dassonville. And these are samples made by Ali Kasumov, and uh, everything's been going on uh, in Orsay and Chernogolovka. Um, so basically the outline of my talk is this. You see this thing, and this thing is a three-dimensional nanowire made of bismuth. It's monocrystalline. And I'm going to talk about the uh, variation from a 3D nanowire to actually the 2D topological surfaces that are on top of the faces of these nanowires and down to uh, 1D edge states that these uh, wires host. And my goal is to probe these 1D edge states with the best tools possible uh, of metascopic physics and actually just by using superconducting contacts, we're going to try to reveal the 1D states that are in these 3D nanowires. Okay. Um, so. All right. So the, the, um, so these nanowires, I'm going to argue, um, are a quantum spin hole candidate. They have surfaces that are quantum spin hole states. Um, therefore, they have 1D edge wires, and, and these are the bismuth nanowires. I'll tell you how we, we think this occurs. Um, then I'll show you um, induced uh, superconductivity through these, wire wi uh, through these nanowires. Uh, I'll argue that the way the induced supercurrent and the maximum of this value, the critical current, depends on magnetic field, can give you a tool to detect where the supercurrent is flowing and show you that it's flowing through edge states. And then I'll give you another tool to um, see what kind of edge states we have. Are they disordered? Are they ballistic? And to see that they're ballistic, I uh, uh, have performed another experiment that's the measurement of the supercurrent versus phase relation. And that tells you what kind of 1D states these are. And beyond this DC probing of a supercurrent through these nanowires, I will show high frequency probing um, that can actually test whether these states are not only ballistic, but also topologically protected states. So, um, uh, so here's bismuth, which is actually a complicated material. Um, and uh, so the, the bulk bismuth, you see, has a Fermi um, surface made up of several <coughs> um, types of carriers. There's electron pockets, hole pockets, uh, with very strong anisotropy. And this is due to the uh, crystalline arrangement. And here what you see is... Um, the atomic structure, um, that's kind of actually, I'll, I'll show you after, it looks like graphene when you look at it from a top. So this axis, this um, uh, C3 or 111 axis, plays an important role. And when you look at bulk bismuth, it's a nice material to work with because it's a semi-metal and with a huge spin orbit uh, interaction and a huge Fermi wavelength. The Fermi wavelength is 50 nanometers. So um, 100 times what it is in, in usual metals, which means that if you make a structure that's smaller than 50 nanometers in, in dimension, you have no bulk states left. That's why you have to take care of the surfaces. So you go, if you make a small structure, you get mostly surfaces, and in a uh, the surfaces, they have a, a usual Fermi wavelength of roughly one nanometers, also very high spin orbit scattering of the order of the Fermi energy, actually, 100 millivolts, and a high um, G factor. And these photo emission shows that these surface states actually are spin split due to high spin orbit. <coughs> so even better than, than this uh, high spin orbit, high G factor, there's some surfaces that are uh, topological. And um, the, sorry, the topological surfaces are the 111 surfaces, meaning the surface is perpendicular to this 111 direction. If you look from a top, <coughs> what you see is, for instance, uh, this arrangement that's a, like a hexagonal uh, arrangement of atoms. This red atom here is coupled to three blue atoms in a triangular lattice. That's exactly actually like a um, crooked graphene uh, sheet. And so if you look at the two, two layers here, you have this um, kind of crooked graphene sheet. Okay, and so Murakami and um, Liu and Allen calculated the band structure of just one bilayer, freestanding 111 bilayer. So this object here. And if you calculate the energy, um, the band structure, what you see is that there's this, this gap. Um, and in the gap, you have states, um, and three states actually crossing the Fermi energy. And these are 
supposedly they're predicted to be 3D, um, sorry, 3, 1D topological edge states. <laughs> okay. Um, Can I ask a question before sure. you go on? But you, you mentioned that it's, it's in, the, in the bulk it has a minimal yeah. and it has a firm of everything. Yeah. So these are, I mean, if, if you drop the same metal into the band crossing point, the firm of everything is infinite. So, so, and your 50 nanometers probably means that actually it's not exactly at the band crossing point, but actually it's uh, somewhere above. So this means that then the lambda firm will, will depend on doping. And, uh, but, but can you have some It's hard to dope. To, to the bulk is hard to dope. <coughs> okay, yeah, the, the, you have a, a bulk and all the quantum experiments that you give to undergraduate students is done with bismuth okay, because you see these huge... quite small uh, wires. Right, okay, so now when you do uh, smaller, actually, yeah, you, well, I'm going to be interested in something where there's very few of these states. So basically the question is, are these two slides connected at all? The two sides? Two slides. The previous slide and, the, and, and this one. Well, if, and, well, as you see, I mean, here there's a gap drawn in. So you have to have this band gap. So you have to have gapped out the bulk states. And I'm going to show you that our system is in between. We, haven't, we have a 100 nanometer, 50 nanometer thick wire. So we have some states everywhere. But we're going to be able to pick out these one, the 1D states thanks to superconductivity, is what I'm going to show. But you, you, you're right. That, uh, in general, when you have a real object, it's, it's not so pure and not so bulky. Um, OK, so, but here is, here's a real object, OK? And people usually believe what's done in STM. So this is uh, Ali Yazdani's uh, STM of um, bulk, bulk bismuth, 111 bismuth. So it's really bulk. But on top of this crystal, there's some defects, some holes. And they chose to look at the holes that had two a bilayer thick um, thickness. So, and what they see is, well, in these holes, if they look at the density of states by tunneling spectroscopy, they see sometimes some states with a high Van Hoff singularity in the density of states, and some, like the blue states, that have no Van Hoff singularity. And so the, the, if they plot the density, the intensity of this uh, Van Hoff singularity, they see that it's in three directions. So these are the 1D states, and these are 2D states. And how do they explain this? Well, here's what I drew, this, this crooked uh, sheet. And you see that the B atoms are coupled to their neighbors and also their underlying layers, whereas these A atoms are sticking up and are coupled to the neighbors, but nothing else. So these are really less coupled to the bulk of bismuth. And these carry the 1D edge states, whereas these uh, uh, B atoms are coupled to the bulk. So that means that even if you take some bulk bismuth, you can have on its surface, at certain, of the certain surfaces, the surfaces that carry at the edges, the atoms that are decoupled from the bulk, you have these 1D states, okay? So, and only the A-type edges show these 1, 1D features. They also demonstrated that, that there was suppressed backscattering at these uh, edges. Okay, so 1D edges are, have also been seen by photo emission, where actually people only take triangles. So they only take these A-type edges, and here they can uh, demonstrate that there's 1D states. So 1D states, even on bulk bismuth, at the top surface, at the 111 surfaces of bulk, bismuth have been seen and whether they're, uh, one, they're topological or not is, is debated. So this is uh, where we come in. Uh, Ali Kasumov grows um, these monocrystalline bismuth <coughs> nanowires um, by sputtering. We scrape them off a surface, um, actually like uh, Francesco Gazzotto showed us, taught, taught us to do. We put them on a silicon uh, chip and we choose we choose with backscra uh, backscattering diffraction of electrons in an electron microscope, we choose those wires that have a top 111 surface. Okay, so we're, we're selecting the wires that have these pot potentially topological 1D surface. And our student, Anil Mirani, uh, simulated, so first the bilayer, 111 bilayer, as in uh, Murakami, found these edge states for a bilayer, but he also simulated something more realistically similar to what we have. Um, meaning a, a wire, so this is not huge, it only has 15 uh, layers, but um, it's a 3D object, and what he sees is you have the, uh, this um, no states in the bulk, this is the density of states, colored, so there's no states in the bulk. There's, on these 111 surfaces, there's no states in the surface, but at the edges, and there's some surfaces that are not the 111 surfaces, because they're perpendicular to the 111 direction, these surfaces have, have a lot of states, so these are the usual uh, diffusive surfaces, if you will. So we have no states in the bulk. We have strongly 1D edge states at two corners, the two acute corners that are carrying the A atoms, and some, some uh, surface states at two other surfaces. 
Okay, so it's, it's reminiscent of topological edge states, but we can't say if it's topological or not. And actually, if you characterize the bulk, uh, I mean, the, whole, the normal state of this, of this whole uh, wire, you see a diffusive behavior. So you look at the re resistance as a function of um, the different, the separation between contacts here in the normal state, which you see is some uh, linear behavior. So this is a diffusive transport across the wire in the normal state. All right, so this is how we see it. No states in the bulk, 1D edge states maybe that I haven't revealed yet to you, and these uh, surface surfaces that are diffusive in the normal state. Okay, so the diffusive surface states carry the normal current, and we will see that all the supercurrent is carried by the edge ballistic 1D states. Okay, so um, I presented our quantum spin hole candidate, and I'm going to show you now the induced superconductivity and it's how we use the field dependence to detect the edge states. So I'm just going to say that why do we use superconductivity? Be because we like its phase. The macroscopic wave function of superconductivity um, makes us, um, gives us a handle uh, as a, to realize interference experiments, right? Um, you have the uh, go ga gauge invariant Josephson relation that takes into account this p uh, vector potential and therefore the current phase relation will depend on how the electrons travel or the, or the Andreev pairs travel in this material. Now, uh, and the critical current is just the Fourier transform of the current distribution in space um, uh, transform with the field. So it's the, uh, it's the absolute value of the Fourier transform of the current distribution. So therefore, for instance, if you have this, um, I don't know, if you have a, a wide Josephson junction with a uniform current distribution, you just have this uh, cardinal sign function. And you have the critical current of a uniformly distributed current in a wide junction that's going to give you this Fraunhofer pattern. Now note that it de doesn't depend on whether it's diffusive or ballistic transport. Okay, and this was put, um, sorry, this was put into use uh, in an experiment on the um, mercury telluride uh, quantum wells by Amir Yacobi and his group, where, uh, so basically this is what I've said, if you have <coughs> a uniform supercurrent distribution, the critical current as a function of B will give you a sinus a cardinal function. Um, and if you only have two paths, well then you know it's a squid, it's, it's a Fourier transform of two delta functions, so it's a sinus, and the va absolute value of a sinus is the squid-like interference pattern you have. So whether the current is uniform or just separated, focused on two edges, is gives you very different interference patterns. And if it's diffusive, you have some Gaussian decay with no really uh, interference bouncing. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the last one is it true if you take into account the uh, maximum currents in S part? So I don't take into account the okay. currents in the uh, S part. Uh, it will uh, increase, uh, but it, it will increase the, the um, effective uh, surface. That's all. No, no. Will provide you the, the, the front open pattern because you will have a phase condition in S. Yeah, but the, <laughs> but the, the thing is that if it's a long, so this is a long, I should have said, it's not only diffusive, but it's long. So this, this is uh, diffusive or ballistic and wide, as you say. If it's wide, even if it's diffusive, you have your, your phase gradient here contributing. So if it's a wide junction, it's the phase picked up along the superconductor that generates the interference but pattern. If it's this, is it, no, no, this has to be longer than wide. A long, narrow wire will give you no interference. I mean, we have the data I can show you. Um, okay, so thi this is because the superconducting phase gradient here does, is much smaller than the dephasing acquired along the long path. That's why. All right? So, um, so this was done by uh, Amir Jacobi's group uh, in the non-topological region of the quantum well. You have a this nice interference pattern, the supercurrent goes everywhere, and in the topological region, they just tuned the gate, there's uh, edge states, and so that's where the, the interference pattern changes. Uh, this is actually the, what I'm saying, in a long, narrow uh, superconductor, gold wire superconductor, you have this Gaussian decay, no bouncing, okay? And just what, it would, what started us working with bismuth is what we, we measured first, bismuth nanowires that we hadn't selected for their orientation, and what we saw was this interference, squid-like interference pattern up to two tesla. All right, so this is what, why we thought that we have this, but over much larger range of field, which means that the edge states are much narrower. Okay, so this is, um, so, so this is why we, we started, I mean, we continued working on bismuth and, and selected the orientation of the wires. 
Um, so what do we do now? So once we've selected these 111 wires, we know they have 111 facets, we connect them to superconducting electrodes using a focused ion beam of gallium ions. All right? This uh, focused ion beam can decompose a gas and generate some alloy of tungsten or disordered tungsten alloy. And this tungsten alloy has very interesting superconducting properties. Um, it's, um, it has a TC of 4 Kelvin, a gap uh, related to this TC, and a, a critical field of 12 Tesla. Of course, and and uh, for instance, when you cool down a, a junction like this, S, bismuth nanowire S, what you see is a zero resistance state up to a critical current. And uh, this, is, this means that you're inducing superconductivity through the, the bismuth wires. You have a supercurrent going from here to there through this bismuth nanowire. And you can plot this critical current now as a function of magnetic field. And this is again what we see. So this is a, another wire than the first one. You see the critical field oscillates with one period as a function of field. It's the squid-like behavior that indicates that you have uh, two channels. The supercurrent is going in, there's two paths. All right, and you can, you can turn your magnetic field to um, kind of uh, see what's compatible with the two areas, and you see that the areas, <laughs> the two zones are at the, these uh, acute corners of the wire. Okay, the fact that it oscillates with field, I just repeat, is, means that there's very few states. They, they're at the acute wire edges, the high field of several um, thousand Gausses or Teslas, depending on the samples, means that the channels are very narrow, and uh, the high critical current we have, it means that they're well transmitted. Okay, so this is um, so so this is this is the first experiment. You just look at the critical current and how it changes with magnetic field. Now, if you want to go beyond this and see what these what really these uh, 1D channels are, you have to um, you have to go and look at the current phase relation. Okay, so um, and so this current uh, phase relation is. What I'm claiming is that it's better than just two wires critical current. When you just measure the critical current here, you don't control the phase difference between the two superconductors. It uh, just adjusts the way it wants to. If you want to control the phase difference, you do, as um, <coughs> Francesco sh showed us, uh, you, put a, you take a ring geometry, you impose a DC flux. Uh, it gives you a phase difference proportional to this DC flux, so you have a phase difference between the two, uh, at the two edges of the, the wire. And you want to know now not what the critical current is, but what is the supercurrent that flows for each given value of magnetic flux or magnetic phase. And this depends on the transport regime in the normal metal. And so why does it de um, depend on this? I'm just going to go uh, fast over it. So you, you've heard about the SNS junction. And, and even before you do use Adele equations, what you can do is the simple um, calculation that uh, wonders what are the bound states, what are the uh, stationary states that can live in this constriction between two superconductors, and you just sum up all the phases and dephasing that occur in a round trip. Uh, so an electron comes here, is reflected as a whole, and b reflected again into an electron. If the total dephasing acquired is a multiple of 2 pi, then you'll get a boundary condition, you'll get a stationary state, and you'll get the energy state. So what are the possible dephasing? Well, there's the the superconducting phase difference between the two, that's a, a the delta phi acquired here. Then you have the time it takes to cross uh, this normal region, so it's uh, the energy times the t over h, h bar, so it's e times the length divided by the Fermi velocity. You pick up twice this uh, phase quantity, and then you pick up a phase term at this Andreev reflection at the boundary that depends on the energy. So basically, once you say this is a multiple of 2 pi, you get the energy as a function of uh, the phase difference, etc. So um, you see that the phase comes in, so the energy, the spectra, and the supercurrent, therefore, depend on the regime because it depends on the time it takes to cross this material. So the, the, I'll give you just two examples. If you have a short ballistic junction, then you can forget about the time it takes to cross this region because it's so short. Okay, so it's short between, uh, in with respect to the coherence length. So then you only have this term, and this term just gives you that the energy is a, <coughs> is a cosine of the phase divided by two. Okay, so the energy spectrum of these bound, Andreev bound states is just uh, branches of the cosine, and if you stay, the system will stay in the lowest energy state, you see that there's a discontinuity here. The supercurrent is the derivative of the energy, okay, with respect to this phase, times the occupation of the state. So the supercurrent is just given by a sine, branches of a sine, with a jump at pi. 
Okay, so this is the supercurrent versus phase relation of a short junction. So it's a very non-sinusoidal. You may be used to the Josephson relation that the supercurrent is the critical current times the sign of the phase difference. This is not a sign. This is really something very um, different from a sign. And if you have a long ballistic junction, now still ballistic but, but long, then you can forget about the, the energy term acquired at the interface and because all the dephasing occurs due to the propagation across this length. And then you get this energy that's linear segments of the phase difference. And if you calculate the supercurrent, well, you also get linear segments with jumps at pi. Okay, so this is a so sawtooth current phase relation, and it's very typical of a long and ballistic junction. Okay, and so you can do this exercise for the different types of regime between two superconductors. And so here's your, the tunnel relation, the Josephson relation that's well known, the sinus. But you see what I showed you here, the short ballistic is very non-sinusoidal, and the long ballistic also has a jump, and a long disordered diffusive wire is almost like a, like a sinus, but a little bit skewed. Okay, so our goal is to measure, if I can measure how much supercurrent flows as a function of the phase difference, I can tell you, okay, you're in a tunnel regime uh, or a ballistic, long, ballistic, short, whatever. Okay, so, and now how do you measure such a current phase relation? Well, I'm we use the, the technique invented by um, the Quantronics group in Saclay. You want to know the current phase relation in this structure. What you do is you build an asymmetric squid. You look at the supercurrent go flowing through this structure in parallel with the structure with a, a higher critical current. So the supercurrent is just the sum of the two of the current in the two branches. In here you have a Josephson junction, so you just say IC times the sine. This is a Josephson relation of this, this big one, but it could be any reference junction. And then you have this second uh, critical current and current phase relation of that's unknown. And so basically to first order in the large critical current of this large <coughs> reference junction, you have the total critical current through these two structures in parallel, that's the first one, plus another that depends on phase. So the only phase dependence is given by the current phase relation of the little um, supercurrent um, junction. Okay, so it's uh, the critical current of the asymmetric squid yields the current phase relation of the junction with the smallest critical current. That's the principle. And so here we go, so we've measured uh, this bismuth wire with these interference that suggests that there's only two paths. What we do is we go back with the focused ion beam and we build this second tunnel junction or second high critical current uh, junction in parallel with the bismuth wire we're trying to investigate. And so here we go. Uh, okay, this, so w what is going to be the current phase relation? So first actually we did, we, we did a reference uh, a test experiment. We took uh, just a uh, SIS tunnel junction, the Josephson tunnel junction, we put it in parallel with the constriction that we built with the focused ion beam, and we checked that the current phase relation was a sign around, so there's a, this si sinusoidal modulation around the high critical current of this constriction. So this is just the, the sanity check. A tunnel junction has a, a sinusoidal current phase relation. Now we do, we do the same with this bismuth wire in parallel with a constriction. And what we see is here's the critical current of these two structures in parallel as a function of field or, and therefore a phase difference. And um, what you see is there's an average value that's the critical current of the tungsten constriction. And around this, there's these sawtooth uh, behaviors. Okay? And these sawtooths are um, the current phase relation of the bismuth nanowire. So you see two curves. There's the red curve at 1 Kelvin and there's the blue curve at point. 0.1 Kelvin, and you should tell me, no, this is not a sawtooth because there's a bump here. Okay, it's kind of a twisted sawtooth, and that's fine. That's fine because actually I expect two sawtooths, right? If I have two, two edge states, you do expect that there's going to be two flux uh, areas, two englobing fluxes, and therefore I'm going to have two surfaces, the interior and outer exterior surfaces, and therefore the beating between two uh, sawtooth patterns. And so you can see this beating in the Fourier transform, you have the second period, and, and this is just a sign that there's two ballistic edges. Absolutely, it's 10%. It's 10% of the total phase and, it, and, it, and it's fine with, with the areas. Uh, yeah. Do they have the same critical current? No, they don't. They don't. They didn't already in the first um, just in the direct two wire measurement, you saw that the squid didn't modulate 100%. There was a 10% modulation of the critical current, suggesting that there's roughly 
10 times higher critical current in one edge than the other. And here also, you, what you see, um, actually, we, you can fit this with uh, one quarter. Okay? You have one quarter amplitude of the first uh, sawtooth compared to the other. So no, they're not transmitted the same way. They don't have the same critical current. And you can also okay, extrapolate and say, oh, well, I have this decay. I mean, they're not perfectly sharp sawtooth. I see 10 periods in the, 10 harmonics in the Fourier transform, but not an infinity. What does that mean? You can extract some transmission of, of roughly okay, T0.9 and, and 0.7. Okay, so that's the fact. We have two ballistic channels, and uh, what else can we see? Uh, you can look at, um, so this is the perpendicular magnetic field, <coughs> so this is each uh, little curve here is one period, and you can uh, put an in-plane magnetic field, and what you see, you see several features in here. You see the current phase can jump, so here you see a big jump, and you can see wiggles, all right? So we've uh, subtracted the linear variation of By with Bz because uh, the sample is not always perfectly aligned uh, with the horizontal plane. But in addition to a linear dependence, you have a nonlinear dependence. And this is phi naught junctions, and this, these are zero pi transitions. So maybe you understand better if I show you the current phase relations. They switch from one phase to a pi shifted phase, and here they just, the, the phase reference oscillates. Right? So we have phi junctions and pi junctions. Um, and this is just uh, an effect, I mean, two effects of the, the magnetic field on Andreev states, because I, I had all these terms at first, and I didn't tell you about the Zeeman effect, that also uh, with a G factor shifts the energy of the um, spin up and spin down electrons or Andreev pairs uh, um, crossing the wire, so that you have uh, a shift in the resonance condition for spin up and spin down uh, spins. So the Andreev spectrum splits with field, and also it shifts this phi naught uh, junction is obtained if you have a spin-dependent Fermi velocity. Then you see that there's also a shift depending on your spin and uh, because of spin-orbit uh, interaction. So these, uh, these features of phi naught junctions and, and uh, pi junctions are expected in an in-plane magnetic field. All right, so this is the first conclusion of the current phase relation in a bismuth 111 nanowire we find a ballistic long junction, and that's not so easy, right? Because if it's long, usually there's disorder and it's not ballistic. So the fact we see a, a sawtooth suggests that it's maybe topologically protected, because these wires, I didn't tell you, but there's the junctions the, are 1.4 micrometers apart. So that's pretty long. So if there's something ballistic over those distances, it suggests it's a, a little more, but I can't demonstrate it's topological like this. We find two spatially separated paths very well transmitted 1D states, confined at the edges of this wire. Uh, I didn't tell you yet why the other 2D uh, states carry much less supercurrent. A pi junction induced by a Zeeman field and a phi junction due to spin orbit. Um, okay, maybe I'll, I'll switch to the next, um, to the last experiment actually, be beyond uh, the supercurrent phase relation. Our goal to, to probe with high frequency to test this topological protection. <coughs> because indeed, one of the questions is how can I distinguish between a ballistic transport and prote protected ballistic transport? So a little sketch would be if you take, okay, the quantum spin hole state at one edge, you have um, this Andrea spectrum, this is for a short junction. One is populated only by a spin down spin, and the other, sorry, this is not an Andrea spectrum, this is a normal state spectrum. This is populated by a downspin and this by an upspin. And now if you look at the normal state spectrum of a 1D ballistic age, well basically I, I can add up, I can add just the other type of spin. These are spin degenerate. So this is the difference between uh, quantum spin hole edge states and just ballistic edge states. And the Andreev spectrum, depending on whether you're short or long, um, they look alike, they look very much like what I showed you before for the usual Andreev spectrum, except they're kind of half because they're spin polarized. So, um, the, um, the difference between a topological insulator and a ballistic conductor between superconductors is really how the spectrum is followed. Now, this is the Andreev spectrum now. Uh, how the spectrum is followed as you change the phase, right? If you have a ballistic but non-topological um, uh, conductor, well, then the energy states that are at the lowest energies are the one follows. So you follow these energy states, the lowest ones. But if you are topological, then this is a downspin, and you can't switch to an upspin. 
okay, unless you have, if you have no time reversal symmetry breaking. So if you have a topological state, you go to a higher energy state even though there's a, a lower lying one here. So basically the current phase relation is going to be 2 pi periodic if you're not topological and 4 pi periodic if you are topological. Now this sh should be easy to see, but in fact there's poisoning. If you wait forever, you're taking a DC measurement, you're waiting forever, there's all the time in the world for an, an elastic process to cause the poisoning of your junction to change the parity of the occupation of these states. So you can make these higher energy states relax to a fundamental state and you recover the 2 pi periodicity. So you can't really rely on DC experiments. What you need to do is, is test at a high frequency probing these crossings. Okay? And this is, to beat these re this relaxation rate, we try to do a high frequency, how much time? It's over, okay, but there's lunch after we have time. <laughs> Nobody's hungry. Okay, so I'll, I'll go to the AC phase driven proximity effect just very quickly. Um, basically what you do is you add to your DC component a field, an AC field that you've coupled into thanks to a uh, superconducting resonator. And so experimentally you look at the time dependent response not just the DC response, uh, and this time dependence is really uh, the AC component at the frequency of your resonator, and you have a non-dissipative response and a dissipative response. Okay, and so you, you, this, this is a probe of the spectrum, how the spectrum, the current, the depends on phase. Okay, and the response that ex is expected is surprising because it's not only the derivative of the Josephson current, which is the static response. There's also some two types of response. One delayed response that's due to the fact that the population can't follow when you're shifting your phase. There's, if there's no inelastic collisions, you can't go to the lowest energy. And this response is in a square of the current. So it's a different way of probing the individual current. It's not just the supercurrent, it's the square of it. And then there's a transition between levels, which is another term that leads, and both of these terms lead to absorption. Okay, so uh, and dissipation. So, um, and why can we, do we say this is a nice probe of topology? Because this susceptibility can distinguish, uh, if there's no topological protection, these Andreev spectrum is split, and whereas if it's topologically protected, there's no crossing, no coupling between these two states. And when you look at the, this uh, response function, you'll see the, the part that's in the square of current. In one case, the current is zero here, so the response goes to zero. In the other case, it's a finite response. And so the, the, the current is violently peaked, actually, at the, at the pi. So if you measure the absorption, you can get um, the, you can probe the spectrum. So this is what we do. So it's Stella Neil who took the same sample and built around it this high frequency resonator with many uh, many modes, so ma many frequencies. So you can follow the response as a function of frequency from 300 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. And this is the response and it's periodic with the flux quantum through the ring. And you can look at this response uh, at different temperatures and basically what you find, so I'm just going to go very fast, you can ask questions, is, is this is what we find in the case of a bismuth, the bismuth nanowire I showed you. The quality factor variation, which is proportional <coughs> to this absorption, is peaked at pi, so it really looks like this, whereas when we did this with a SNS junction, you see that it's zero at pi. All right? So this looks more like the usual case and this more like a topological case. So um, I think this is, this is all for now. Um, We've studied these edge states and we've seen edges because, for instance, the interference pattern of the critical current tells you the current is flowing at edges. Ballistic edges is revealed by the current phase relation and topologically protected edge states is suggested by this AC response measure measurement of the diagonal susceptibility. Okay, there's ongoing questions, but uh, I think we'll, we'll stop here. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs>